A winter storm turns a Vermont road into an icy death trap. Two teenage boys try to make their way home. The road is slick, the tires slide. Seconds later, disaster. As the car fills with freezing water, the boys realize they are trapped. Now, rescuers must fight bitter cold and impossible odds to attempt a rescue. I've been on other cardiac calls that don't have good outcomes. To be honest with you, I didn't have a whole lot of hope. With each passing second, emergency personnel are in a life and death struggle to save victims that are submerged. It was November 22, 1999, a few days before Thanksgiving. An early snowstorm blanketed Newfane, Vermont. The National Weather Service had issued a travel advisory for the area. It warned of a treacherous driving condition known as black ice, a thin layer of frozen water that takes on the color of the underlying surface. What looks like a normal roadway is actually a dangerous sheet of ice. Many travelers had only one thought on their mind that evening. Get home. Even as the snow stopped falling, it would be hours before many of the two-lane country roads would be cleared and salted around Newfane, a small town where everyone knew everyone. George Place and his classmate Caleb Record left basketball practice at the high school around 7 p.m. Caleb was a starter on the varsity team and ranked eighth in his class. He and George had been friends for two years. The weather had turned cold and the boys weren't wearing coats. They only lived seven miles away. Caleb's mother worried as she waited for him to arrive home. The roads were often unpredictable this time of year, especially for an inexperienced driver. The weather was, was kind of nasty. Caleb, he had not driven in a lot of snow, and I was concerned that why they even had practice because the roads were kind of slippery. Caleb took Route 30 and then turned onto the river road to take George home. It was a windy, one-lane dirt road. The conditions on the river road were much worse than Route 30. And there were a series of sharp, dangerous curves. All right. Yeah, yeah, I can't see it anymore. Oh, that's, that's all right. All right. Yeah, calm down. Caleb quickly discovered that the car was not responding like it normally did. The river road was much more difficult to navigate than he had imagined. When he pressed on the brakes, the car hit a patch of black ice and kept going straight. The car would not stop. The terrified boys braced themselves as they hit a snowbank. The car 
car's window shattered and the roof flattened. They landed upside down on the river's bottom. Water poured in. The panicked boys were trapped, submerged in near freezing water. Within seconds, their arms and hands went numb from the cold. They couldn't even unlatch their seat belts. To make matters worse, the car continued to shift in the river's current. Within a minute, the boy's core body temperature began to drop. Blood pressure and pulse decreased sharply, leaving them confused and disoriented. Finally, George managed to unlatch his seatbelt. Caleb was still trapped. They had been under freezing water, holding their breath for almost two minutes. George knew that if he didn't get air into his lungs in a matter of seconds, he would pass out. He did the only thing he could. He clawed his way out of the car. The water's near freezing temperature robbed his body of heat 30 times faster than cold air. He swam ashore, ignoring the excruciating pain shooting through his legs and arms. Hypothermic shock was setting in. His reflexes were failing. If he did not get immediate help, Within 15 to 45 minutes, George would be dead. Caleb. Still, he found the strength to call for his friend. Caleb. But Caleb was still trapped in the car. As the car sank deeper into the river, George knew he had to do something. Caleb! 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 If he went back into the river, he would certainly die. He had to get help for Caleb and himself if they were to survive. The embankment was steep. Broken glass and metal shards from the car's descent cut his hands and knees. Confused and frightened, he stopped to see if his friend had gotten free. There was no sign of Caleb. George's body temperature continued to drop. Exposed to the elements, wearing the soaked t-shirt and shorts from basketball practice, he was shaking uncontrollably. The pain in his arms and legs was unrelenting. But he knew he had to go on. Inside the car, Caleb had stopped struggling. He had been underwater for nearly four minutes. When George reached the top of the embankment, he knew there would be little chance anyone would drive down the river road in time to help Caleb. He made his way to Route 30. 
His limbs were so cold he could barely move. Time was running out. George finally reached Route 30, but there were no cars on the road. Then, in the distance, headlights appeared. Hey! He used every ounce of energy he had left to wave them down, screaming, crying to help his friend. The first car didn't stop. George stood in the middle of the road and waved frantically. The second car stopped. Stop! Hillary Chamberlain saw that the boy was in serious trouble. He was soaking wet and shivering so violently he could barely speak. All he could say was, car in river, car in river. What happened? I don't know. What? And you just gotta go. He's, he's oh in the okay. Rodney Chase and Jerry Paradis were in the first car. They turned around and headed back to the boy. Rodney couldn't understand what George was trying to say. He kept saying there was a car in the river, but the river is three or 400 yards from Route 30. Finally, I, I kind of yelled at him and I said, you know, you gotta tell me what, where the river is, what the problem is. And then he said, well, you, that we had to go down the side road. George finally told them that he had managed to escape. But Caleb was still in the car, submerged under the water. Hillary helped George into her car. It was clear he was freezing. She knew they had to get help. Jerry and Rodney started down the dirt road. They looked for any signs of an accident. As they came to a sharp bend in the road, they saw tire tracks that led down the embankment to the river. Rodney pulled a flashlight from the car. Jerry scanned the river below. We saw a car in the water, upside down, tire sticking out. It was pretty dark, you couldn't see much other than what your, head, what your flashlight hit. The car itself wasn't that far offshore, maybe four or five foot deep, right off the edge. I mean, you didn't have to go out far before it was you know, up to your chest. Rodney and Jerry climbed down the embankment. If there was a passenger in that car, they had to get him out. Debbie Record was getting more anxious. The school was only seven miles away, and Caleb was overdue. Hello, Kate. Have you seen Caleb? I knew he had gone to practice. I knew what time practice had gotten out, and he hadn't gotten home as quickly as I thought he should have. As Hillary raced to the sheriff's office, George slipped into shock. His body temperature continued to fall. Caleb had been submerged nearly 15 minutes. His body was cold. He was unconscious, or worse. Watch it, Jerry. I was pretty scared, because I, I knew it was a steep bank, and I wasn't sure what we'd see once we got to the edge of the bank. I wasn't sure I wanted to see what we were gonna see, but 
I knew it wasn't going to be good. The bank was really steep, and uh, it was it was basically clear of like trees and stuff like that. But it was pretty rough, and it was like I said, real steep. So we pretty much had to go down. However, we could get down there. It was it was rough going. So I get down there, I'm like, are we gonna risk our lives to go in this ice cold water and there's not anybody in the car? Was he actually by himself? Or do we take a chance and there might be somebody in there? It was a critical decision they had to make in an instant. If Caleb had any chance at life, the two men had to act now. It was November 22nd in Newfane, Vermont. Caleb Record and his friend George Place had just left basketball practice and taken a back road home. On an icy road, Caleb lost control of the car. It tumbled over a 100-foot embankment and landed upside down in the icy river. George Place managed to make it out of the submerged car. He struggled up the embankment and went to get help. He flagged down Rodney Chase and Jerry Paradis. The two men now had to decide whether to plunge into the icy water themselves. I wasn't so much scared about him going in the water. I was more scared whether or not he was going to find somebody in the car or not. I really didn't want him to find anybody in the car. I was hoping it was empty. Rodney plunged into the freezing water. The worst part was actually getting in the water. That's why I'm, I think if I'd been alone, I might not have done it. The water temperature was so cold, it took his breath away. Rodney began to wonder if he had made a mistake. When I first got in the water, I, uh, it was very shocking. Um, it had been quite cold um, that day, and, and the water was real cold. I had second thoughts about going in the water because I thought if I got in too deep that I was going to become a victim instead of a rescuer. Hillary Chamberlain turned up the heat as far as it would go. She was concerned that George would succumb to hypothermia. He was shaking uncontrollably. The roads were slick, but she drove as fast as she could. Rodney finally reached the car and tried to open the door underwater. It wouldn't open. The door was locked. The door won't open. We were communicating back and forth. You know, I was asking him, you know, what do you got? I mean, is, is, can you find anything? Is there anybody there? Rodney reached through a broken window and unlocked the door. But now it was stuck on the river bottom. Using all his strength, Rodney pulled it free. He reached into the car and felt a cold human hand. Someone was trapped inside. Rodney tried pulling, but the body wouldn't budge. He said, I think I've got something. And I'm, and I'm up on the bank, I'm like, no way. No, you don't have nothing. Please tell me you're wrong. When I did find somebody, I believe he was wedged between the seat and the door. No matter how hard he pulled, he couldn't get the body free of the car. At that point, I moved a little closer to where they were at. And I looked down with the flashlight, and sure enough, I saw a belt and jeans, and I knew he had somebody. Somebody's in here. They're stuck. Yes. 
I actually thought I was gonna have to stick my head under the water to try to find somebody, which I didn't want to do because I was afraid I'd get trapped in the car. Hillary finally made it to the sheriff's department with George Place, who was suffering from hypothermia. Hillary told the dispatcher about the accident. She quickly called Newbrook Fire and Rescue. Fire and Rescue, overturned vehicle, possible victim inside. The firefighters manned their emergency vehicles. Within two minutes, they were on their way to the scene. Dispatcher helped Hillary bring George into the sheriff's office. The teenager was pale and delirious. In the river, Rodney continued to try and pull Caleb's body from the submerged car, but the seatbelt was restraining him. I was, I was pretty shocked. I was, at that point, I got really scared. I wasn't sure what we were gonna do at that point. I can't get him out. He called to Jerry, telling him to bring his pocket knife. Jerry took the knife and started cutting the seatbelt. I think the adrenaline had taken over, and I wasn't, I wasn't afraid um, for myself or, or because there was a dead person in this car. George could hardly move. I'm gonna go get him some blankets. It's so cold. It's all right, you're okay. Hillary rushed to cover him with blankets. I don't know what to do. I'm gonna get him an ambulance. The dispatcher called for an ambulance. Rescue unit immediately. The ER staff at Brattleboro Memorial Hospital had heard over their police scanner that a car was upside down in the West River with a body trapped inside. They immediately sent the hospital's rescue squad to pick up George at the sheriff's office. Diane Vergara, an ER nurse, alerted the staff. that it was a snowy or a wintry night. We were just more attentive knowing that it was a car into the water, so we just were waiting. Jerry used his pocket knife to cut through Caleb's seatbelt. They pulled the boy from the car. It's hard to even move, let alone you know try to carry a person out. I mean, I'd only been in the water just a couple of minutes, and I had a hard time getting back up on the rock. Together, they carried him to the riverbank. I, mean, I would have had a hard time getting him back up on shore by myself, but my cousin kind of grabbed my hand, and we, he pulled me, and I pulled this body out of the car. Oh. Oh, this Caleb was not breathing. He appeared dead. My first impression that we just pulled a dead guy out of the water. I mean, he was blue, cold, lifeless, kind of stiff. I mean, it was, it wasn't pretty. High school student Caleb Record lost control of his car on an icy Vermont road. It plunged over an embankment and into a freezing river. George Place, sitting in the passenger seat, managed to get free. 
he climbed up the steep embankment in a desperate attempt to get help for his friend. On the road, George flagged down Rodney Chase and Jerry Paradis. The two men pulled Caleb from the car, but the boy wasn't breathing. Couldn't really see him good, which is, is probably a good thing. Um, because I just remembered the person was really cold and pale. Jerry knew CPR and immediately began chest compressions. One, two, three, four, five, he go. just started uh, doing chest compressions and I figured, well, if he's gonna do chest compressions, somebody's gonna do rescue breathing. So I used a CPR kit and uh, started doing rescue breathing. Caleb barely responded. When I was doing the rescue breathing, I could hear a uh, rattling sound as I was giving him breaths. And the breaths that was coming back out, I remember, I'll never forget, there was a really bad smell to it. I heard later that the rattling sound was probably acorns that had gotten into his lungs from the water. Despite Caleb's limited response, the two men continued administering CPR. When it comes to doing the CPR on the guy, too, I mean, there's always a chance, especially with the water that cold, that something could happen, you know. At the sheriff's office, George Place was loaded into an ambulance. His body temperature had plunged to 94.5. I just wanted to be warm again, and I, I couldn't. And, and I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if, I didn't know anything at that point. Debbie Record was frantic. She couldn't find her son. I was just trying to piece it all together. I was trying to, you know, Caleb was a good driver. Um, so I was just trying to think what could have happened. You know, did he hit a tree? The roads were bad. Have you seen him? Okay. Thank you. Just a lot of things were going through my mind. About 15 minutes after Jerry and Rodney pulled Caleb out of the water, the Newbrook rescue squad arrived at the scene. I was beginning to wonder because I wasn't sure how long we'd been down there. And I wasn't sure how far away help was because I'm not really from that particular area. Firefighter Mike Fontaine took over for Jerry. He continued chest compressions on Caleb. I was pretty scared. I didn't know what we were going to do at that point. I mean, it, I figured I'd seen my first dead person. I don't like funerals, and I don't usually go to a lot of funerals, but he looked like any dead person I've ever seen. Fire and rescue trucks arrived. I was doing the CPR because that's what I was trained to do. I just thought that I was, you know, doing CPR, going through the motions on a dead person. The rescue workers brought a backboard and an oxygen tank from the truck. In order to evacuate Caleb, they would have to run ropes down the dangerous icy slope. It's a steep bank, and I mean, we had to put several ropes down over and several people down over the bank and have like a chain line to bring them up over. And it was very tough. That's the way everybody came down, but it was incredible that nobody got injured going down over this bank where it was, because it was just straight down. The rescue workers came to the aid of Fontaine and Rodney. 
The medics continued CPR on Caleb. I looked at the car and I recognized it. And I said to one of the other guys who was there, is that Caleb's car? He says, yeah, it is. They sent a backboard and more personnel down the embankment. Caleb's neck was secured with a C collar. I mean, I would have never guessed if somebody said that was, you know, didn't tell me that was Caleb, I wouldn't have guessed him. That's how odd it is. They quickly loaded Caleb on the backboard, secured him, and wrapped him in thermal blankets. Not till after I was standing back on the rocks there that I realized who was I was actually doing CPR on. Rescue workers tied themselves to ropes and helped move the backboard. Slowly but surely, Fontaine and other rescuers pulled themselves and Caleb up the treacherous embankment. To be honest with you, I didn't have a whole lot of hope. Uh, but it was one of my first experiences where a, a young cardiac victim, and I had heard of the uh, submersion in cold water effects, how it does slow the metabolism down, and how people do have, you know, hope when they've been chilled, you know, rapidly. So the guys that were going up, one hand on the backboard and one hand on the rope to pull himself up through. The rescuers finally reached the top of the embankment where Caleb was loaded into an ambulance. Paramedic Elena Mayo assessed his condition. The questions that I asked, the things that I want to know, how long was he unconscious? Has he woken up at all? Did he ever have a pulse? Did he ever uh, move? Was there any response to anything they've done so far? And the answers were all negative. He didn't have any movement, he didn't have any pulse, he didn't have any respirations. There was no reaction to anything they'd done. Paramedics did everything they could to revive Caleb. They intubated him so they could administer oxygen directly to his lungs. Knowing how long he was underwater and knowing the physiology behind it, you only have four to six minutes, eight maybe, if you're lucky. He was under there 20 minutes, 30 minutes, then he had to get brought out, then he had to be brought up to the road, then he had to be put in the ambulance. That's a lot of time, that's a lot of time. And I didn't have a whole lot of faith that he was gonna be able to, even if he did survive, that he was gonna be able to come back well. Caleb's body temperature was only 82.5. They had to somehow raise it. They continued to hyperventilate him and gave him a shot of epinephrine, Caleb still had no pulse. On an icy November night, 16-year-old Caleb Record lost control of his car and tumbled down a 100-foot embankment. It landed upside down in the river. Two men pulled Caleb from the wreck. Now rescue workers were taking the boy to Brattleboro Hospital. No vital signs. Nothing. The, the defib tells you whether or not it's a, there's a shock ball rhythm. If it says no shock, there's nothing there. And there was nothing there. So I just kept calling his name and telling him, come on, come back to us. Now, after several minutes of CPR, they had a slight heart rhythm. Now the defibrillator says shock indicated. Whoa, which is really cool. 
and uh, and then the, the machine starts to to whistle, and it, hum, a higher and higher pitch as it's building up a charge, and then it says, push to shock. You reach over, push the button, and then push. it gives the jolt, and then Caleb's heart started again. And that was. He has a pulse. The paramedic had to t tell us, uh, all right, now calm down. Um, we're not done yet. And uh, we knew, you know, we'd made progress, but that Caleb still wasn't clear. Come on. All right, Caleb. George Place arrived at the hospital. Paramedics put me in a, like a big silver lining. It's like a some kind of solar blanket, I guess it reflects the heat off you. Like, so it keeps the heat in. And they wrapped me in that, and I, I immediately, I, I was in there a couple of minutes, I started getting warmer really fast. The hyper-hypothermia blanket had caused his temperature to rise from 95.4 to 98.1. The doctor checked for internal injuries, broken bones, and spinal cord injuries. Other than a slight cut on his knee, George was not harmed. Then Caleb arrived at the hospital. Arriving at the hospital, we just all jumped out of the rig, got the stretcher out as quickly as possible. At that point, they had their team ready to take over. He's been in the water for 20 minutes. The ambulance driver has been 20 minutes. He was totally unresponsive. What we want to do is we want to get them warm. We want to get a core temperature and we want to get them warm. Caleb's pupils were dilated. His left arm was blue and blotchy. He still had no blood pressure. His temperature was 92. They needed to raise it. He was cyanotic, which is uh, what happens when you're submerged in cold water. A police officer arrived and asked George about the accident. Yeah, they're working on him right now. George tried to fill in the details, but he heard the commotion in the adjacent room and couldn't get his mind off of Caleb. I'm laying in this bed and Caleb's in the next room and for all I know he's dying there and I, I had no idea and I felt helpless, I couldn't do anything. Sadie, why don't you call Steve? Debbie Record, Caleb's mom, still wondered where her son was. Debbie asked her daughter Sadie to call some of Caleb's friends to see if he had dropped by. Uh -huh. She'd no sooner said this when a car pulled up in front of the house. It was firefighter Wayne Wynott. Wayne told me that there'd been an accident and we needed to go to Bradford Hospital. He said, grab your things. And I said, well, the girls can stay here. And he said, oh, no, 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 you bring the girls with you. And he said, and I'll drive your car. And I said, no, I can drive myself. And he said, oh, no, you can't. He wouldn't even really tell me anything. I mean, he didn't say Caleb had drowned. All right, let's get his nasal tube in. Doctors inserted a tube into Caleb's nose. Okay, let's get on board, uh, two He had a lot of water in his lungs. The tube allowed the respiratory therapist to suck water from his lungs. They pumped out over 600 cc's, nearly half a liter of river water. They told me that he had water in his lungs, his uh, temperature was real low, and he barely had a pulse, and he, he wasn't doing good. Caleb was given two amps of sodium bicarbonate to lower his acidity level. Dopamine was administered to raise his blood pressure. 
they finally got a slight reading. Caleb's heart and breathing were stabilizing, but they would need more tests to determine damage to other organs. They had done all they could at this small county hospital. Even though he thought Caleb's condition was bleak, the doctor knew he would need more advanced facilities if he had any chance of a recovery. He called Dartmouth Medical Center. Once Caleb was fully stabilized, they would transfer him to the university's trauma department. I was thinking the worst. I was thinking that he was dead and laying in the next room to me. Debbie and her husband, Greg, saw some of the paramedics who had been on the scene. They told her about how the car had flipped off the road and into the river. I didn't really know at that point, but then people started coming to the hospital and coming in our room, and then, then, we, then I found out that he had drowned. They tried to encourage her saying he didn't appear to have any external injuries. But sadly, they weren't successful at resuscitating him. Caleb was now breathing with the help of life support. Tragically, his brain function was gone. The record's family doctor arrived. He had known Caleb since he was born. The two doctors realized they would have to share the terrible news about Caleb's condition with the boy's family. Caleb was probably not going to make it. In New Fame, Vermont, Caleb Record and his friend George Place slid off an icy road and down an embankment. They landed upside down in the river. George had gotten free, but Caleb was submerged for nearly 20 minutes. Now the attending emergency physician and the record's family doctor had to tell them the terrible news. Caleb was brain dead. They needed to consider turning off life support and donating his organs. The doctor that was on call that night came in and just said, things are not good, um, but I'll keep you up to date. This would be a good they told Debbie and Greg that they could see their son. He said there was, uh, his pupils were dilated. They were getting no response. Uh, definitely there was brain damage. And that um, we should go in and <clears throat> say our goodbyes. The records couldn't believe what had happened to their son. Debbie tried to see if Caleb was still there. She spoke loudly to see if he could hear her. It did feel like it was the last time. Um, the doctor came in two or three times and just it wasn't good. You know, he kept saying, he's brain dead, he's brain dead. Caleb squeezed Debbie's hand. Oh, he just squeezed my hand. Every time she spoke loudly to him, he responded by squeezing her hand. I said, he just squeezed my hand. And I said, watch this. And if I spoke, he would squeeze. And that's when I said, we can't give up now. The University Medical Center in Hanover, New Hampshire could offer the kind of advanced life-saving equipment he would need. It gave me a feeling of hope. 
I just said he can't be brain dead if he can squeeze on command by me. Caleb arrived at Dartmouth Medical Center. He survived the trip, but he was still in critical condition. Temperature at 10 points to 90. I gave him a shot of epinephrine about 40 minutes ago. Any transfer is risky, especially with the condition that he was in. Anything can change. We had no idea how long he was in the water, so you know, there's, there's so many unpredictables. Anybody that's unresponsive um, and being in the situation that Caleb was in, you know, I, wouldn't, I would never say that they're stable enough to transfer, but you, you never know what's going to happen a long route. Anything can happen at any given time. Debbie and Greg arrived at Dartmouth around 12.30 a.m. Caleb was stabilized and they could see him. I don't know what I was thinking at that point. I wasn't, um, I was thinking that it was gonna be bad. That whole night, of course, you can imagine there wasn't a lot of sleeping went on, but it was just pretty much, um, you know, a little crying, a lot of just holding each other and just trying to get through that night and see what the morning brought. Dr. Levin apprised the records of Caleb's condition. During recovery from that kind of injury, the brain swells. And because the brain is in an enclosed, rigid space, our skull, there's not much room for swelling. And the pressure itself then makes the brain start to crowd in on itself. It could be damaging to the brain. All through the night, the doctor and his staff continued to monitor Caleb. When morning came, Caleb was still alive. Slowly, he began to improve. Two days after the accident, the specialists believed Caleb could breathe on his own. He turned off the ventilator. Caleb began to breathe. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was pretty amazing. Um, kind of gave every gave me goosebumps. Good job, Caleb. Then, just a few days after the accident, Caleb woke up. He even started walking. I just tell people point blank. I witnessed a miracle. I, I am firsthand saw it and, and see it every day. And that's the only explanation I've ever been given and it's the one that I believe in. It was a miracle. To think there he was only a few days ago and now he can walk and talk. And I think I got deep down inside. I, I, I'm a pusher <laughs> and I wasn't gonna give up on him at that point. Caleb went into rehab and made remarkable improvement. In June, he graduated from high school. Today, Caleb is attending junior college and works part-time. He has something to say to those who rescued him. I just like to thank everyone, but obviously I can't because so many people helped. And I'd just like to say thank you again. For Caleb's dad, there is still one person who deserves more credit. As far as we're concerned, he's a hero. If George had done what he'd done, my son, and I don't, my son would not have lived. To us, he's a hero. For George Place, life is its own reward. Life is really good. I'm thankful that I'm here to live another day. And I'm thankful that Caleb's here to live another day. And for the people of New Fane, Vermont, life has never been more precious.